like always great tension because of course doing live recording you've only got one chance to get it right and there would be Michael coming in he would give a, a running commentary all the time about what he was doing now I, I, I must demagnetize the heads and don't put those headphones there they'll magnetize the tapes Michael Gerson's contributions to the world of audio are probably more extensive than most people who have heard of him even realise. In those days, if you were recording, it was on tape. Michael Gerson and his friend Peter Craven looked out the one remaining member of the OUTRS, who was Stephen Thornton. He was in the fourth year of his biochemistry degree and not really able to do anything. So basically he said, well, would you like to take over the Oxford University Tape Recording Society? So that we did, and we got into um, tape recorders, microphones. Peter and Michael were the two with tape recorders, which we carted around the city from venue to venue. I think it was in Oxford that the enthusiasm really came together. And that's why after the initial cross-fertilisation with people like Felgit and so on, the development concentrated on Michael and around Michael. Michael was the technical guru who produced ideas that hardly anybody else could understand, um, but I was able to half understand what Michael said and, and either explain it to other people or uh, reduce it to practice, actually by building circuits. <laughs> oh, come on. This is Peter Craven. I am speaking directly behind the microphones. Are you sure about that? Because I don't think you are. <laughs> well, more or less. This is Michael's take us when he knows who he is. Uh, Michael should probably be a little bit out of phase. I think uh, Richard should appear. <laughs> We decided to make a tetrahedral recording of Mozart's Coronation Mass, which was going to be performed by the Schola Cantorum on the 8th of May 1971. I was involved with it because I got to know Michael Gerzen, and the year prior to this recording, I'd been in a team from my university at Guildford doing very similar work, this concept that stereo wasn't really enough and that we would enjoy music more if it was reproduced with full surround sound rather than the sort of flying saucer surround that everybody had come up with. The old one was up on the basket, I remember. Gosh, this is bigger than I remember it. This is huge. I can remember it being very crowded and having quite a lot of tech because there was OUTRS stuff here recording twin track. It was all a bit chaotic. At that time, uh, it was all very primitive. We used retort stands, which Stephen has filched from the um, biochemistry department. And then they were set, we set up a playback in this very room. So a lot of Michael's later mathematical theories were based on intense listening to that one playback. That was really the, the birth of the concept of the sound field microphone. <laughs> He would never have let go of the idea that the music and a complete representation was at the heart of what he was doing.
he was unfortunately afflicted with illness, both asthma and ulcerative colitis, so he would have to keep going off to the loo at awkward times. I was very sad when he died because he was, he was a good mind to have in the industry because the recording business is on this interface between performance, music entertainment, commerce, and obviously you've got theory of how microphones work and what the knobs do and how you can communicate the music. He was good company too, we did have quite a few laughs. When we listen to sound, when we're hearing it, we're surrounded by it. We know we're surrounded by it. So the idea of an ambisonic recording is that it enables you to hear sound from all around you. If you represent the sounds in your virtual reality using the ambisonic format, you can then link to say, to sensors on your virtual reality headset or your headphones, whatever, and you can, as a person turns ahead, you can rotate the sound field so that the sounds remain stable as their head turns. And this makes them far more realistic. It's being used for gaming. It's being used for VR. It's being used for a few movies, for some sports things. And that's going to grow. And that's where Michael's legacy will come forward again. I'm sure he would be delighted by the interest in surround sound and surround sound with height, which is at last starting to be taken seriously. So I think he would be very pleased that we finally got back to a rotationally invariant system and, and the fact that it's being commercialised at affordable prices.